Mental health care can be tough to access on a good day, but in the midst of a crisis, it can feel impossible. It's a problem the Boston Globe's Kara Baskin knows well. And to kick off Mental Health Awareness Month, she shared her experience in the paper. Writing about her struggles to find a therapist and navigate crisis care systems only set up to respond to life or death situations, while at the same time, quote, trying to keep it all hidden from her two young kids, not easy, while working because, you know, psychiatrist and therapy appointments are expensive and not usually covered by insurance. Of course, mental health support can look different for everyone. Also for the chair of the Board of Directors for Samaritans Incorporated, Samantha Joseph, who recently shared her experience about coming to terms with the suicide of a beloved relative in the New York Times. Help came from the most unlikely of places, the words of actor David Schwimmer. Samantha Joseph and Kara Baskin join me now. Samantha, jo Samantha Joseph, Kara Baskin, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. So, thanks so much. Kara, I wanted to start with you, the, the acute case, as it were. Can you finish mm -hmm. setting up the scene that you wrote about, the episode you wrote about, where you found yourself in a crisis that sent you to the emergency room? Uh, yeah. You, you've had issues with anxiety in the past, but ever anything like this before? Yes, yeah, so um, once before in 2007, and I had written about that when it happened too, I was actually on my honeymoon in Hawaii, my poor husband, he's been, <laughs> he's been through it all with me. I started getting a series of panic attacks that would not go away. Um, and basically I had to take a leave of absence from work. At the time I worked at a fancy magazine in Washington, DC. And that was really, this was back in 2007. And this is really before anybody said the words panic attack or anxiety. There was a little talk of depression, but really not that much. And I really could not go to work. Um, I was that debilitated and I had to sort of come clean with my bosses, with my editors and explain what was going on. And, you know, everyone surprised me with their compassion. Um, it turned out that my boss actually had panic disorder as well. I ended up going on the Today Show and talking about it and it was really cathartic in the end. Um, but at the time back in 2007, it was incredibly isolating. And it all came roaring back again in 2019. And in that time, I don't quite know what, what set it off, except for a kidney stone, which might make anybody go a little bit nuts. But well, that, that's, that's pretty traumatic, though. Yeah, which it was had to go through traumatic. I've been in a lot of pain, and I hadn't been sleeping. And I was sort of right back in the same place that I was in 2017, or in 20, um, 2007. You, you lost so, like 30 yeah. pounds, you wrote. It sounds pretty brutal. I mean, best diet ever. But I was really <laughs> miserable. And somehow I was still managing to work and sort of keep up appearances and this duality can be really hard because unlike a physical illness, you know, it, it doesn't manifest often outwardly, it's very private. And unless you tell people, they might not know that you're suffering. And you're in a situation right now though where you, you've, you're taking care of two young kids. Uh, right. so, so talk about how uh, a, a job two young kids are caring for, how, right. how do you fit in a crisis? Yeah, and you might hear one of them in the background. I apologize in advance for the Zoom situation. Um, it was really hard on them and I felt terribly because, you know, I'm a person who's really high energy. You might be able to tell I'm pretty outgoing and I really didn't leave my bed. I did not leave my bedroom for a couple of months and my kids definitely knew something was off. They were in, I believe, third grade and preschool at the time. My husband was really doing it all. I had a lot of support from my brother, which was great. Um, but, you know, absent that family support, I was sort of just slogging through on my own and trying to keep up appearances for my children. and. You know, I'm not sure that I did such a good job. My older son um, began to be afraid of being left alone and he was afraid if I wasn't around him and he didn't like to be left with other people and he was a pretty resilient kid. So to see that behavior change in him, it made, it made me feel badly. Let's yeah. talk ab about your experience with, with care, that, that initial trip to the emergency room. Mm -hmm. How how did that go? How did the doctors it was react one of to you? Several. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, it's not their fault. ERs are not set up. They're not oriented. They're not oriented toward the type of problem that I had. Um, they want, and very rightfully so, they want to keep you from harming yourself, and they perhaps want to detox you. But they're not dealing with this sort of grim drudgery of every day, where you might feel this agony and despair. You know, they're not oriented toward getting rid of your existential despair. They just want to keep you alive. Um, so I got there and, you know, they did the things that they were supposed to do. They followed protocol. They drug tested me. And then, you know, it really only serves, though, to make you feel even more alone because I was given two choices and neither of them really felt like a choice at all. I could go to an emergency um, or I'm sorry, a psychiatric floor 
of a nearby hospital, a locked unit, which meant I wouldn't see my children. I wouldn't have my laptop. I wouldn't have any of my, any of my things. Um, and I would be there for a week. Um, or else I could do an adult daycare center. And that's really what they call them, adult day therapy. And you go um, every day for maybe six to eight hours and you get treatment. And for me, that wasn't viable either because I worked and I needed to work. I needed you know, income because psychiatry and therapy aren't cheap. So neither of them felt like an option. And I just ended up going home and you know, uh, toughing it out for another couple of months. And there, there, there was a point though where Things, you said that it, it's not like there was a turning point so much, but gradually a, a point at which the, the good days right. outnumbered the bad mm -hmm. days. Yeah, and that's the thing that I think, you know, when we hear narratives about mental illness or any kind of illness, there's always an arc, right? There's always sort of the initial descent, and then there's sort of the triumph. And this wasn't a, a cinematic story. This wasn't like one day I woke up and I was healed or I took a magic pill. It was just like hanging in there day after day after day, faking it a little bit if I had to, you know, I, I tried to still work and I tried to be cheerful and I tried to be up and maybe I was lying a little bit to other people just to kind of keep up appearances, which, you know, a lot of us who have mental health struggles do. Um, and then one day in late December, I just remember waking up and not feeling so badly anymore. And that's exactly what happened to me in, in 2007 as well. And that's really what I was trying to get across with this piece is, you know, it might not look the way you think it's going to look. It's not like you confide in a friend and they make it all better, or you go to the ER and they heal you. Healing is a little bit more private and it can be quiet, um, but, you know, hopefully it really does happen and there is hope. And then, Samantha, in your case that you wrote about, we're also talking about a very long process. Uh, Samantha, Joseph, you write about uh, the suicide of your beloved aunt. This was more than 20 years ago. Yeah. Uh, first though, tell us about her. What was her name? Tell us why you loved her so much. Thank you for asking that. I think it's really important to me to remember her life, you know, not just how she died. So her name is Gail. She was an incredible person. Um, you know, when I was a little kid, she was the most interesting adult I had ever met um, because she lived in Hollywood and she was friends with, you know, people I watched on television. And, you know, I've had the, the joy really of connecting with people who knew her in the last couple of days since the article came out. And just, just to hear over and over again how beloved she was, how much laughter and joy she brought to people's lives has been really special. She, she was 39 uh, when, when, when she killed herself. Yeah. And uh, as I mentioned, that this was 1999. Yeah. Uh, obviously, that's a situation where uh, feelings can be deeply unresolved. There, there must have been some, obviously, there, there were questions that were hanging around that, that caused it to stay with you so long. Yeah, I, you know, I was 16 at the time and it, it was such an isolating experience. You know, back then, kind of like with Kara, people weren't really talking openly about suicide. There was a lot of stigma, you know, and so people who have lost loved ones were really kind of alone with that grief, even though it is one of the most common experiences people have. You know, when, when I talk about it now, I'm, I'm meeting people all the time who've experienced something similar. Um, so what's so important is that organizations like Samaritans, in addition to providing crisis services, are actually providing grief support services. You know, so we're, we're connecting families with each other who've experienced that loss to create that space where people can really share openly, where they don't feel judged. Um, and what we understand is that when somebody has had a loss to suicide, they're actually more at risk, right? So, you know, it's not uncommon to see more than one suicide in a family or friend group. And so by supporting loss survivors, we are actually doing suicide prevention, right? We are really potentially providing that lifeline. Wow. And uh, I know suicide that happens at any age, obviously, is horrendous and tragic, but... Um the age of 39, that, that's, I think, in grief counseling, they call that an out-of-order death. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the kind of thing that it's just, um, it's really difficult to resolve that, right? Yeah, and, and I think kind of like Kara said, you know, I, one of the friends I spoke with yesterday, one of her friends said if she had just been able to push through that hard time, right, you know, that she might have come out the other side of that, you know, and had the opportunity to live many years, you know, and, and to contribute more, uh, to do her job, to be with her family and friends, you know, it's in those critical moments of crisis, you know, to find the support that you need so you can can get past that, you know, and and that's what Samaritans is there for. You know, recently the country have developed a three-digit phone number for getting help, right? So it's 988. It's never been easier to remember. And the idea is that, you know, that 
ideally we, we're providing a lifeline. It doesn't work for everybody, you know, but the hope is that for people who call it, you know, that it might just, it might help them get through that one hard night that allows them to keep fighting just a little bit longer. I want to talk about the David Schwimmer moment, but, but first, uh, the, the point in this essay that, that really struck with me, stuck with me, and I think a lot of people probably who, who read it, was you engaged in something, uh, past life regression therapy. And, and I, I just mentioned to people th that uh, this is something that it, it might sound out there. It's actually not. It's actually something that's quite legitimate in grief therapy. It doesn't mean you believe in past lives, but it's also a way of being able to deal with things. So having stipulated that for you, <laughs> tell us about this experience you had with the, the past life regression. Yes, I'm lucky that one of my closest friends decided to become a practitioner. So it was a, you know, a person that made me feel really comfortable. Um, and the idea that really resonated for me was that, right, I didn't have to believe in anything. If I learned something helpful, you know, I, I could give that meaning for myself, no matter where I thought that wisdom was coming from. You know, and the idea that in this moment, as a result of this experience that I got, I got this wisdom that there is no why. Not that there's no why she died. You know, there's a lack of mental health care. There's, you know, all kinds of reasons why people, are, why we're losing people. But that as a person in grief, trying to make sense of it, you know, that, that I could spend the rest of my life asking questions and I would never get an answer that was gonna be enough. And if that was true, it was time to move on. And that uh, finding out that there is no why is, is liberating somehow. Yeah, I thought that it gave me a chance to stop asking, you know, f to stop looking for information that would explain why she died and instead to give me a chance to celebrate who she was, right? And to really remember the kind of person she was and not to let this like one dark moment in her life define her. So your aunt was a writer for the TV show Friends she in, in the 90s. Yeah, she actually was, um, she sort of managed part of the comedy division, so she actually got to, instead of writing, she was actually working directly with the, the cast wow. um, and helping them, you know, with their public lives. And, and you've long wanted to talk to David Schwimmer about her and finally got the opportunity to. T tell us first about the build-up to it and then what the actual exchange was like. Yeah, and, you know, I she had worked with many um, celebrities, and so, it, it, you know, I would I would have been excited to talk to anybody who had worked with her. I just, I understood from her friends that there was something very special um, about her connection to him, and that, you know, she admired him, and, you know, she came into their, the lives of that cast right as they were becoming, you know, kind of superstars, you know, so she played this really pivotal role in, in being their kind of caretaker and protector. Um, so, yeah, I, I always was interested in connecting with him. Um, I found out he was going to be at a conference. I, I think I made up a pretty bad excuse um, as to why I should go to this particular conference and, and just decided that this was like my chance to maybe learn something about her that would give me a sense of, of peace. And what did he say? Yeah, I mean, so nervous. You know, like I made this beeline for him so that I wouldn't lose my nerve and I just kind of like spit it out. You knew my aunt and, you know, I kind of waited. And he just immediately, everything about his face, his, his posture changed. He said um, that he remembered her, you know, that, the, that they loved her, that the cast loved her, which is like everything I wanted to hear. And then he, he went even further to say that this conversation, that it meant something to him, you know, that, that my asking him about her gave him a chance to think about her and that he, he appreciated it. And so that was, you know, to, I think that's what I've heard in the days since I wrote the story is that is what any one of us could hope when we're talking about somebody we lost, that somebody else would say, thank you for giving me the chance to remember them, you know, kind of says everything you need. Well, Samantha, thank you for this. It's been wonderful speaking with you. Thank you, I appreciate it. And Kara Baskin as well, great pleasure talking with you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me.